Well, you know, I was thinking about this uh, recently this week, and, and sin is one of these really annoying words. Uh, we don't use this word very often anymore. Uh, here's a graph that shows the use of the word sin in the books that have been published since 1800 until now. So you can see it kind of peaks at the early 1800s, and then it's been in decline ever since. We don't want to use this word because it causes problems. It's one of these words that makes us think about judgment and hell and all those nasty things. And who wants to be thinking about that? That's such a non-inclusive, non-tolerant kind of a thing. And, and, and it, lots of churches don't want to talk about it either because it's, it's kind of hard on attendance. You know, uh, People don't want to show up when we're talking about sin. Uh, when I was a, a conference minister and also part of the Board of Faith and Life, and I, I still am serving in that board, uh, one of the things that we were involved in is going to churches that are in serious conflict. And uh, it's not a very uh, enjoyable event to go into a church when there is this complex layer of issues that are piled on top of each other, trying to help sort through all of these complexity and trying to bring health back into a church. And, and one of the things that invariably comes up at some point is this word sin. Somebody did something that is sinful. They said or did or thought or whatever, and it was labeled sin. But there's a hesitancy to actually doing that because when you start to use the word sin in a conflict situation especially, but in other cases too, you're making an absolute moral judgment. And if you say that somebody is a sinner, then somebody might say that about you. And if they call you a sinner, then, then you're going to be held accountable. And so we try to avoid the use of the word sin. Uh, I looked up the definition in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, and it defines sin like this. It says, an offense against religious or moral law. What's the moral law? Well, the next line actually defines a little bit more that a sin is transgression against the law of God, a transgression of the law of God. So sin is something that we say or do, that is a deliberate act against God, against the divine law that he has established for us. That it's, and so if somebody is accusing me of sin, then I'm going to be impacted by that, and I'm going to think about how, you know, that's going to make me feel bad for one thing. It's going to make me not think good about myself. I might even feel bad about myself, that I'm a bad person. And so we try not to use this word very often. Instead, we use the word mistake. We use the word, oh, you've made a mistake. So I looked up that definition. What does the de dictionary say about mistake? Well, it says this. It's an error in action, calculation, opinion, or judgment caused by poor reasoning, carelessness, insufficient knowledge, etc. And so we can say, oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I made an error in judgment. I, I was careless. I didn't think through it. I didn't have sufficient information. And uh, so I, I'm sorry. I, I should have known better. But my bad, right? And so we use this kind of language. Try this next time when, if you're married and you have a heated argument with your spouse, say, you know, it was a mistake. Nobody's perfect. Get over it. See how well that works in that situation. But there is a difference between a sin and a mistake. The assumption behind a mistake is that I don't really need to ask you to forgive me. Because, well, I just say I'm sorry. Everybody does it. No one's perfect. Just get over it. It was just a mistake. When we talk about a sin, it's a much different situation. Because everything, if everything can be boiled down to a mistake, that there was just this error of judgment, that you um, just made this, uh, you weren't thinking about it clearly, or, or you didn't have enough knowledge, if you just made a mistake, then I'm not sinning, and if I'm not sinning, I'm not a sinner, and if I'm not a sinner, then I don't need a Savior. 
So if I am not a sinner, then I'm a mistaker. And if I'm just a mistaker, all I have to do is just do better. I just have to work harder. I just have to be more consistent. I have to be more careful. I have to make sure I get all the information that I need. I'm just a mistaker. I'm not a sinner. But if I'm a sinner, that radically changes the definition, the fundamental nature of who I am. It's saying something about me. And therefore, just trying harder isn't actually going to fix it. Because if I'm a sinner, then I've likely done something or said something or thought something that's going to hurt someone. And I owe someone something. And there's need to be accountability for all of this. And so trying harder isn't going to make a difference. It's not going to fix it. And if I'm a sinner, then I need a savior. So this got me thinking about how does guilt fit into all of this? If I'm a mistaker, do I really need to feel guilty? Because everyone makes mistakes. And you can say, well, a mistake is a mistake. I didn't really mean to. I wasn't paying enough close attention. I wasn't thinking through this. Uh, you know, I didn't have, I wasn't old enough. I wasn't mature enough. Boys will be boys. You know, learning opportunity. Whatever you spin, you want to put on it. You don't have to feel guilty about a mistake. So it's a good thing that we are mistakers instead of sinners, right? I mean, that's what we want to keep it to. Because if you haven't sinned, then you're not a sinner, then you don't need a savior. But if it is true, but if all of that is true, that we are just mistakers instead of sinners, then why do I experience this guilt? Where is this guilt coming from? Is it just a, a problem in the way I'm thinking? You know, uh, Sigmund Freud, the famous psychiatrist in the early 1900s, actually said something very similar, similar to about guilt. He says that guilt is really just a pathological thing that we have. That it's a distortion, it's a mental illness and a result of depression and so on. That's what he was describing guilt as. But he was probably leaning more towards what false guilt is. But not all guilt is false. Some of it is actually real. And so you have this description that James, the brother of Jesus, says, and it's kind of a startling statement. James chapter 2, verse 10, he says this, that the person who keeps every law of God but makes one little slip is just as guilty as, a, as the person who has broken every law there is. And so James is helping us to understand what, what guilt is all about in relationship to whether we're a sinner or a mistaker, and, and, he, and he agrees with all the other apostles, and he says that, that we actually are, the reason why we feel guilt is because, well, we're guilty. And he blows past all of this, this debate about whether we're mistakers or whether we're sinners, because he says, well, even if you slip up just one little tiny bit, you're just as guilty as the one who is the worst sinner of all. And so they all agree, the apostles in the scriptures say that sin is actually a transgression of the law of God. And when we break even the smallest example of it, we are guilty to the greatest extent. One of Mark Twain's famous quotes is that man is the only animal that blushes or needs to. They're all, all of us have experienced things that we have said or that we have done that we are greatly ashamed of. Uh, we are embarrassed by it. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want anybody to find out about it. And so we experience this guilt, and we should feel guilt because that's normal. Interestingly enough, there is a, there's a small percentage of the population that does not feel guilt. There's a, a designation for this group. It's called uh, a psychopath. We've used that language, psychopath, sociopath. Now they're back to psychopath again. And what they mean by that, a psychopath is somebody, and the, the term that they use is called moral depravity. This is not a theological term they're using. They're talking about a, a mental designation. There's moral depravity. They cannot distinguish between right and wrong. And so they can actually commit heinous crimes and not even feel guilty about it. 
And so we think about that, we realize, well, that's not normal. This is a great dysfunction. Because God created us to function in his way that he has created this world. And he has given us guidelines. And when we stray from those guidelines, when we go our own way, when we decide to do something independent of what he has called us to, there is pain. There is hurt. We hurt ourselves. We hurt others. We hurt the heart of God. And so when we do that, we experience something. It's a warning. It's called guilt. Because God wants us to live, not to die, because that's eventually where we're going. If we continue to go our own way, apart from how God has created us, we're going to end up dead. And so God wants us to live, so he provides a warning. Now I imagine most of us can relate to the psalmist uh, who writes this in Psalm 38, verse 4. He says this, My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. Uh, we can have these, these examples in our life where we are just overwhelmed. This weight. And we're just thinking to ourselves, I hope that nobody finds out. And so we have this sense of guilt. But is that all what guilt is? Is that all it is? Is that all it is is that you feel bad. That you, that you have this awful feeling and God wants you to experience that as kind of a punishment for what you have done. Is that all it is? Well, no. It's much more than that. The purpose of guilt is much greater. Guilt is this warning light. It's telling us that something is wrong. It's telling us that we are headed down a path that is going to lead us to some very uh, bad situation. It's like the warning light on the dashboard of your car, you know, the engine light that comes on. I have a friend who actually took black electrical tape and put it over top of his engine light because it was always on. And he didn't want to deal with it, so he just covered it up. There, it's gone. And how often do we respond to guilt in the same way? We just try to pretend it's not there, that it, that it doesn't exist, that you know, everything's okay. So I want to talk to you about how do we deal with guilt. There are two main ways. There's man's ways of how to deal with guilt, and we'll look at that, and then we'll talk about what God's ways are for us, how we are to deal with guilt. But before we do that, I want to quickly talk to you about there are two kinds of guilt. There's what's called true guilt or real guilt and false guilt. What is real guilt? Well, real guilt is when we have broken God's laws. And God convicts us. The Bible tells us that we are all sinners. There's lots of verses in the scriptures that tell us that. Probably one of the most famous ones, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we have all broken God's laws. We have all gone our own independent way. We have all not trusted God in certain areas of our life. And therefore we have hurt ourselves, we have hurt others, we have hurt God in that process. And so legally, in our position before God, in the court of law, we would be found guilty because we have all gone astray. Whether we feel guilty or not, it doesn't matter. But we are all in a position of guilt before God. And we, if we persist in that, we are headed for an eternity apart from God. But then, of course, God provides saving grace. And that's what we talked about last week. That when we receive his saving grace, the grace that now provides salvation, that now God sees us through the blood of Jesus, and he looks at us, and we're no longer guilty, but we are actually righteous in his eyes. That's a remarkable act of grace. And so even though we may have accepted this salvation, this free gift of grace, even though we may have that position before God, there are still times in which we go our own way. We still make decisions that are apart from God. We still decide not to trust God in, er in areas. And so as followers of Jesus, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit convicts us. And he points this out to us. This warning light goes on. Something is wrong. That's guilt. That's real guilt. That's the real deal. Then there's false guilt. What is false guilt? 
False guilt often happens when, when we just kind of conjure up things, that we, we're so worried that this warning light is going to go on that we actually make it come to, to come to pass just by worrying about it. These are things that we say to ourselves, what would people think of me? Uh, or we have this vague feeling, we're, we're not really sure where it's coming from, what the source is, but we're just kind of feeling guilty about something. Uh, sometimes in this mental space, we can send ourselves email, like mental email rather, where we're saying to ourselves, you think that's enough? You call that acceptable? Look at all the things you haven't gotten finished. You have disappointed the people around you. Those are the kinds of things that we send to ourselves. It's all part of false guilt. False guilt can also happen when we are caught up in the cycle of, of sin and, and abuse in other people's lives. It could be somebody very close to you, a parent or a friend, and something that's happened, and, and you feel that guilt about what they are doing, what they are caught up in. Maybe you were a small child, and maybe some things were happening at that time, and you didn't know how to sort through it, and you have this sense of guilt because you were caught up in this cycle of, of terrible sin. Maybe you even feel guilt about one of your own children who has made decisions that have, have been, uh, you know, very difficult and has caused a lot of problems and you feel guilt over that. False guilt also arises when you can't let go of your past. When you think back and you, and you ask God, Man, I, I ask God to forgive me, but I just don't feel his forgiveness. Um, he has, I just don't feel it. I think all of us have experienced false guilt to some degree in our lives. Now the Apostle Paul actually addresses this in the book to Galatians. And there were people there that were experiencing some false guilt. And so what they were trying to do is they were trying to overcome it by doing more, by doing lots of good things. And so this is what Paul says. He says, uh, you began your life in Christ by the Spirit... Now, are you trying to make it complete by your own power? That is foolish. And so this is one of the byproducts of false guilt, is that you're trying to, trying to cover it up by doing more, by, by doing good things, by trying to live by your own power. And Paul says, well, that's foolish. So how do you tell the difference between real guilt and false guilt? How do you know the difference? How do you know when it is that God is providing this conviction in your life? And how do you know when it's your Uncle Bob from a fundamentalist church that is giving you this guilt? How do you know the difference? Well, here are three things to think about. Number one, first one is that, is the focus on people or is it on God? Dr. Paul Turnier has says this, that false guilt is that which comes as a result of judgments and the suggestions of men. True guilt is that which comes as a result of divine judgment, what God thinks about the situation. And so when we struggle with false guilt, what we are often, do, often doing is focusing on what man's ju judgment and, and opinion is. And so we're focused on, on that. We want to gain approval from others. And we become approval junkies, basically, because we're always looking for approval from others. It's people-based as opposed to God-based. And this is terribly tiring, by the way, because trying to meet everyone's expectations is quite impossible. So the first thing to ask yourself, is it people-based or is it God-based? The second thing is to ask whether it is vague or whether it is, whether it is specific. You know, some people would talk about guilt as this, this cloud or this fog, and, and, and you just don't know exactly where it's coming from. You don't know why you're feeling it or what the source of it, it, it all is. But, but when you feel this cloud, when it seems very vague, you can probably count on that being from the enemy, from Satan. It's not clear. It's just making you feel bad. When God talks to us about our sin, he's very specific. It's like this laser pinpoint of light on this issue that you are facing. And, and God will use all kinds of things, people, circumstances to help you understand what he is is actually trying to pinpoint. And you'll, you'll, maybe you'll listen to a sermon or maybe you'll read something in the Bible or even something on the radio or TV or what other people are talking about. God can use all kinds of circumstances to, 
pinpoint and help you understand what he wants to convict you of. And so, uh, you know, this is one of the things that God uses to get our attention. Thirdly, is it rules or relationships? And so when you're struggling with, with false guilt, the feeling is, I have broken the rules. When you are struggling with real, genuine guilt, then it is, I have hurt someone. So false guilt is dealing with, you know, the rules, the, the regulations, the religious pieces. But genuine guilt is dealing with relationships. I've hurt my spouse, I've hurt my children, I've hurt the heart of God because of what I've did. So that's the difference. False guilt rules become more important than relationships. In the church, it becomes more about duty than it does about desire. False guilt has a way of blinding us to the work that God is doing in our life, whereas um, it, it, uh, but rather it, bl it binds us to the rules of men. So how do we deal with get guilt, regardless of whether it's true, real guilt or false guilt? We have to deal with it. We have to manage this. And so there are two main ways, whether it's man's ways or God's ways. And so one of the, we can go all the way back to the beginning, Genesis chapter 3. Someone sent me this picture this past week. And it says this, Adam and Eve, the first people to not read the Apple terms and conditions. So if you're an Apple user, you kind of get that. Um, but this is a, a reminder of what happened very in the early in the beginning, the very first man, the very first woman, the very first sin. This is how they dealt with guilt and see if you can identify with that. So obviously Genesis 3 describes that God had placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and he provided just one commandment that they should not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, they did not trust God that what he said was true. And they failed to obey his commands. And they experienced something they had never experienced before. And that's what guilt is. So how did they respond? They responded in three ways. First of all, they responded, responded with shame. Genesis 3 verse 7 says this, At that moment their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. So this is what happens when we experience guilt. We feel shame. We feel bad. And we, we, we're, we're feeling embarrassed by it. So sometimes what's interesting is that we, we actually, the, we, we think that if we feel really bad about what we have done, somehow we've, we've covered it. Right? So I just feel terrible. Uh, but it doesn't, doesn't work. It doesn't fix anything. Shame does not work. The second way is hiding. And so we have this in verse 8. It says, When the cool of the evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. This is the first game of hide and seek, I suppose, that they were trying to hide from God, which is the equivalent of putting the black electrical tape over your dashboard to hide the warning light that is glaring at you. It just doesn't work. Imagine them trying to hide from God in the bushes. Does that make any sense whatsoever? That simply does not work. The third way that they reacted was by blame. This is a very popular one. Listen to this. So the Lord God asked, Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, What have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. And so we see this blame game happening right from the very beginning. And uh, when God asked Adam this direct question, uh, Why did you do it? He took it like a man and he pointed to his wife. That's what we do, right? Uh, it's her fault. But it's actually very interesting if you look closely at the wording, Adam actually not only points to his wife as the problem, but he actually does a dig to God. He says, well, it's the woman that you gave me, God. You gave me a defective woman. Uh, and that's the reason why there's a problem. And of course, the Eve, with all the fingers being pointed towards her, 
she responds and she points the finger to the serpent and of course the serpent had didn't have a leg to stand on and um, that's a real groaner isn't it oh that's terrible terrible but these are the ways in which we deal with guilt we we feel the shame we try to hide from it and we blame we are so good at doing that but none of those things work and so what is God's way what does God say that we should be how we should be dealing with guilt and this is what he says it's through his grace um, probably one of the first memory verses that I uh, verses that I memorized was 1 John 1 9 and uh, this has been formative in my spiritual life right from the very beginning so if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us or to purify us from all unrighteousness this is God's way of dealing with guilt this is the powerful example of God's grace so this uh, the first part is our part if we confess and then we have God's part we have God's character his faithfulness then he is he is able to be trusted and then he is what he's going to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so let's take this apart let's look at this bit by bit as we understand how God wants us to deal with guilt so the first thing is that we are to confess confess your sins and so notice that it says confess your sins not your not your mistakes we are not mistakers we actually are sinners confess your sin not your needs not your problems not your frustrations but confess your sins and so I confess that I have this propensity to separate myself from God to do my own thing to trust in myself instead of trust in God and so I am going to confess that that is the reality you know I know it's it's not in vogue to talk about sin even in church sometimes it's not in vogue but but the sooner that we recognize that we are sinners the sooner that we can embrace God's grace the sooner that we can recognize that we are in desperate need of grace the sooner we can actually experience it and embrace it that's what God wants for you so how do we confess our sins you tell God you just talk to him about it and he's not going to be surprised by what you have to say he already knows that we can try to hide that but it's no use in Psalm 69 verse 5 it says God you know what I have done wrong I cannot hide my guilt from you now, there's nothing more difficult than try to hide it you've probably tried it and it's very tiring it's very exhausting it's very costly to try to hide from God and from others and so just be honest and tell him confess that and what does it mean to confess confessing is not just admitting to God that you have done something wrong the word confess literally means that you are in agreement with what God thinks about it so you are agreeing with God with what he says about what you have done and when God says this is a sin this is breaking you are transgressing my law then you are saying I agree with you God that that is true what I have done has grieved you it is wrong that's what confession is and how do you do that how do you tell God well you do it through prayer you do it by like talking to him you can even do this right now even as we are sitting in this room we can we can confess to God God I recognize that what I've done and what I've said or what I've thought is grievous to you that is transgressing your law that I've gone astray I've not trusted in you and you can even make a list I actually recommend this if if you are journaling at all or, or whatever just writing things down and then crossing it out or crumpling it or burning it or whatever you want to do to try to acknowledge that that God's grace has now forgiven you and you are cleansed another part to this that I find really helpful is that verse in James 5 16 that says confess to one another confess your sins to one another pray for each other so that you may be healed there is healing when we confess to others and, and we need people in our life that we can talk openly and honestly about of what we are dealing with because 
there is healing because it diminishes the hold that sin has in our life. It shrinks it down. It makes it less, uh, less of a bondage in your life. And there's healing. Uh, that's, uh, no one gets rid of an addiction alone. They can only do it in community. And the same thing with us and our sin. Because all sin literally is an addiction. It is going astray from God. We are, we are compelled. We are, have this propensity to do that. And so we have to confess that to one another. And experience that healing. Confess your sin. Secondly, it's trust in God's character. If we're going to experience God's grace, we also have to, we also have not just confess our sins, but also learn to trust in God's character. Learn to get to know the one who is forgiving us. It's not enough just to, to confess. We just need to actually engage in a relationship with the God who is forgiving us. So it says he is faithful and just. That's his character. You can count on God that he is faithful, that he will he will actually forgive you. Some people decide that, that they, they don't want to get close to God. They can't get close to God because they don't actually feel his forgiveness. But this is really a trap to say that. If we say that we are, uh, I, don't, I don't feel close to God, I don't feel his forgiveness, but actually what happens is that the closer you get to God, the more you will experience his love, the more you will experience his grace, the more that you will know his forgiveness. That's the, the beauty. That's what we sang about this morning, is that there's, there's no longer uh, a barrier for me. I can actually come to God. I can trust in him. So as long as you hold God at arm's length, you're not going to feel his forgiveness. Look at this invitation in Hebrews 10, verse 22. Let's go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting in Him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. That's an amazing promise. So He is inviting us to be cleansed and now enter into, now once you've experienced this grace of God, he actually says, the next step is to draw to me. Draw close to me. And when you draw to God, you will experience more of his grace and his forgiveness. You don't become the person that God meant you to become through guilt. You only become the person that God has meant you to be through his grace. And so draw to him. Come to him. Thirdly, in this verse, it says, accept God's forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And then it ends by saying, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will purify us from how many of our righteous, unrighteousness? From all of our unrighteousness. Not most of it, not a portion of it, but all of our unrighteousness. That three-letter word is a pretty important word for us to understand about grace, that he has offered us cleansing from all of our unrighteousness. I know sometimes it is so difficult. People struggle to believe that God forgives us of all of their sins. Most of their sins, maybe, but not all of them. Look at the promise that God gives us in John 3.18. 3, uh, 3, yeah, chapter 3, verse 18, it says this, People who believe in God's Son are not judged guilty. So if you are a believer in Christ, he has set you free. He has forgiven you. You are no longer in this category. So when we believe in Christ and trust in what Jesus has done for us, we are free. You know, there are so many stories in the Bible that we could point to of God's grace. There are lots of them, right? If you think about Abraham, and uh, Abraham started off his life by worshiping idols. And he had a lot of problems with lying, by the way. But now we look back and we see Abraham as the father of our faith. We think about Moses. And Moses started off with murdering someone. And we think to ourselves, boy, that's pretty bad. How, how is this going to end? And yet we look at Moses as somebody who has set the Israelites free from bondage in Egypt and brought them into the promised land. We think of John Mark, who, who was on a missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas, and John Mark got scared, and he left. He didn't even make the full commitment, and, and you know, what happened there? But now we know John Mark is somebody who is the author of great ex the gospel in the New Testament, the book of Mark. Everything about Paul, 
who started off as Saul. And Saul was somebody who was persecuting the church and Christians. And, and he was actually standing there as the Christians were being killed. And he was nodding in agreement as this was happening. And yet Paul now, we know him as someone who has written a third of the New Testament. And so when we think about God's grace, it's not just that he is forgiving you of our sins, but he actually wants to do something grander and greater than what you can ever think or imagine. He wants to use you in a brand new way. That's the beauty of his grace. And that's why he wants you to embrace it. Let me leave you with this verse in Psalm 32, verse 5. The psalmist says this, and it says, I finally admitted all of my sins to you and stopped trying to hide from them. I said to myself, I will confess to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Isn't that a beautiful verse? And so some of you may need to have that, that first part of that psalm that, that says, you know, I finally admitted all of my sins. I finally stopped hiding. Maybe some of you are there and you need to, uh, you need that first half and you're willing to admit to God, God, I need your forgiveness. Or maybe you need the second part of that verse and where you say, and you forgave me, all my guilt is gone. And so you can rest in the promises that God says that he will forgive you because he is the God of grace. It's not because you deserve it. It's because of his love and his grace for you. That's the beauty of what he has. Let's bow our heads in prayer. And I invite you as you, as you uh, focus on, on what God has been speaking to you about today, that you would take this opportunity just to talk with him, to admit your sins before him, and maybe you want to say something like this in your own heart and say, Father, I confess my sins to you. I am agreeing with you about what you say, that I've done wrong things, that they have, they have hurt me, they have hurt others, they have hurt you. And I'm, I'm trying to, I'm tired of trying to make up for them and trying to, to try to cover them up or trying to do good to try to cover it. I... I just ask for your forgiveness. Will you forgive me? Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross so that I could be forgiven. Thank you, Jesus, that you paid the penalty for my sins. I, I trust you. I trust your character. I trust that what you say that you will do, you will do it. That you are faithful. That you will forgive. And so today, I, as best as I know how, I accept your forgiveness into my life. And so help me to live this new life of grace, to operate in that. Now some of you may have already prayed that prayer many years ago. But maybe you need to pray something else. Maybe you need to pray something like this. Father, help me to live your life of grace, not a life of guilt. Help me to, to embrace this, this fresh air of what it means to live by your grace. To trust fully in you. And I'm making this commitment to take your word as it is to trust you and to know that my guilt is gone and so God we thank you in Jesus name we pray amen all right we're going to give uh, a couple of minutes to have some Q&A if you have some uh, questions that you would like to ask about this message we give you that opportunity and uh, Ingrid has a microphone, and if you just raise your hand, she can come to you. We were walking from door to door and gate to gate in the Ukrainian village doing uh, mission work. And we came to this house, and uh, the gentleman came out of the door, 
and um, greeted us. And uh, my translator, teenage translator, explained, said, we have come to talk to you about God, and we have a Bible to give you. And he said, I, I don't need God. Uh, I'm, I really haven't done anything bad. I haven't robbed the bank, and I haven't killed a person. I'm fine. I don't need God. And then I turned to my uh, translator, and I said, tell him that the Bible tells all of us, uh, declares that Christ died for us, and he forgave our sins, because we needed that. But Christ didn't die for him. And my translator looked at me with big eyes, and I sort of pulled back, and I said, tell him that. So he did, and the man just burst out. He says, how can you say that he didn't die for me? I said, well, you're so good. You're better than anybody else. He, it would be a waste of life to die for you because you're so good. Oh, he says, give me the Bible. <laughs> Well, that sounds like a spirit-led uh, response, uh, Selma. That's, that's very cool, because Jesus says, I didn't come for those who are well, only those who are, who are sick, right? Um, so if you think you're righteous, then yeah, it's not for you. Very good. Lana. Can you, can you speak to um, how to deal with false guilt? How to deal with what, sorry? False guilt. False guilt. Yeah, so first of all, it's identifying what if it is real or false, right? So, uh, so there was those three things that I gave um, about whether it's like vague or specific and so on, those three things. Um, and then once you have identified that it's false guilt, then really it's trusting in God that this is not something that is from him, this is actually from the enemy, that the enemy wants us to be mired in confusion and in... Uh, in, in, in you know seeming debt that's not real, that's not true. And so we reclaim the truth of what Christ says about us, that we are righteous in him. That doesn't mean that we are, uh, so we, we're, we're talking about uh, a couple of things here, right? So our standing before God is righteousness through the blood of Christ, and we stand before him as holy. But in our walk with him, when we falter, when we lack trust in him, we cause the heart of God to be grieved. And so we ask for forgiveness for those sins, and we allow the healing to come through his grace. Um, but the other vague and nonspecific and rules-oriented kind of, of false guilt is from the enemy, and we reject that, and we accept the guilt, that the conviction that God has given us because he wants us to live. So um, it's part of understanding the truth about how God has created us and what he wants to do in our life. So, yeah, thank you. Mary, up here. Um, Mary. I was just thinking, like, um, when, when we do have guilt, that is, we've hurt someone and we confess that to God, the next hard step, which is really hard for us as human beings to do, is to go to that person and apologize to them and ask them for forgiveness. Yes, yes. Especially, it's especially hard when they don't want to forgive you. Yes. And yeah. so, isn't that the next part of yes. of of genuine guilt of hurting God or? His yes. people is also that step of going. Yes. And like, as a teacher, I try and model that for my kids because it seems like in this generation or society, we have a hard time asking someone, like going to someone and apologizing. So I feel like I have to model that all the time for my kids at school because it's hard to do to go to someone and say sorry and but often kids are better at it than adults hmm. and I don't know yeah. just yeah so our our uh, our relationship with God we keep short accounts with God and so we experience conviction of him about something we have done wrong we 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 confess that and we receive his forgiveness and as we make uh, cause disruption in our relationships with other people we also need to sh keep short accounts and we need to confess our sins when we have impacted and hurt other people and sometimes that includes reparations too sometimes that means that we actually have to um, to uh, to respond in in a way that would 
bring healing to that relationship. Um, and that's not, confession isn't necessarily going to do that. We actually have to engage in, this is what I'm going to do now to not do this ever again. Because I know that I've hurt you and I don't want to hurt you again. And so um, that's another level of discussion that we could have about how do we deal with sin when we have impacted other people's lives. Yeah, so it's, it's a good question that we could go deeper into. Okay, I think last question. Mark, you had the last question last time too, but I think we need to have the worship team come up and lead us in song. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, is it on? Is it working? Hello? Okay. I always believe that the uh, original serpent had four legs to stand on. And yeah, God cursed legs. them. God cursed them and took them away and said, get on your Are you, are you trying to ruin my joke? Yeah. <laughs> it's not very hard. <laughs> Oh, we can't leave that with the last word, can we? <laughs> All right, we'll let the worship team do that. <laughs>